Hey friends, today I thought I would answer a question that I get asked occasionally, and that is, are humans still evolving? And there's a really simple answer to that question. Yes, just yes. Because of course they're still evolving. Whenever you have uh, imperfect replication, when you have, whenever you have variation, then every generation is going to have subtle differences from the previous one. So of course, evolution is still ongoing. But I thought today I would try a different tack because I'm a developmental biologist and I'm interested in reproductive biology. So let's just take a moment and look at human evolution through the lens of gamete production, the formation of sperm and eggs. So we're not even going to consider adults in this discussion. We're just going to ask, is evolution going on in the gene pool in sperm and eggs? I think this is an important perspective that gets neglected far too often. Remember, we all started out as a pair of gametes, and we have then grown into adulthood. And the process of producing gametes and of producing a zygote is a long, complicated, chancy, dangerous one for the individual cells. So, of course, there's plenty, plenty of opportunity for evolution to take place. Before I get into my main point, though, there's something I have to address. I'm going to be talking about human sperm and oocytes, and inevitably, someone is going to come along and say that, well, hey, this biologist is calling sperm human, therefore, he thinks every sperm is sacred and that human and sperm and egg and zygote are all synonymous. I don't. I disagree thoroughly with that position. And part of that is true. Every sperm, every egg, every zygote, every fetus is human. All that human modifier tells you, though, is the source of the species, that it came from Homo sapiens. Uh, one of the big problems we deal with is people who so eagerly equate human with person. They are two very different things. So, yes, this is a human zygote I'm showing you here. Okay, but this is also human. These are human blood cells. And this right here is a human cancer cell. Because something is human, we don't automatically confer upon it full personhood and say that it deserves citizenship and membership in society and all the human rights associated with that. Conversely, we have decided that, for instance, human babies are conscious, thinking, self-aware, complex entities that are pers persons deserving all of those rights. We don't get to pretend that they don't. Likewise, human young adults may be really, really annoying, but they still have all the rights of personhood and have to be respected. Uh, I also will add that us old people, we also have all those rights, even though we may be close to death in years. We hope not. Anyway, uh, so personhood is just something independent of human. And that's particularly difficult when we consider situations like this. These two chimpanzees. Hmm. These are not humans. We can definitively say that they're not human. But they are thinking, self-aware creatures that maybe we ought to consider as persons, even though the law does not, and even though scientifically they are not human. Okay, let's get back on track and contemplate the human gene pool. The gene pool is that vast collection of allelic variation, all the different forms of our genes, and is the total stock of gene forms present in our gametes. Note, we're not talking about the familiar adult individuals that we think of as the mass of humanity, but solely the great big soup of sperm and eggs they are constantly producing, the deck of cards we draw from to produce each hand in the game of life. The first point I want to make is that this is not a machine stamping out a stream of identical parts. This is an engine of randomness, pouring out chance variants of the same basic model. These variants aren't predictable. You, if you are a person with functioning gonads, are sitting there spinning out endless different combinations of alleles in your gametes, and the gene pool clearly has far more diversity than the population of adults capable of watching YouTube videos. So let me give you an example of estimating this diversity. 
Imagine a diploid individual like you. Diploid just means you have two copies of your genetic information. Gametes are haploid, which means you give each gamete a copy of half your genome. Let's use a simplified version. Say an individual has a grand total of just four genes, A, B, C, and D. In a single person, each gene can come in a maximum of two flavors. If you have two different forms of A, for instance, that means you're heterozygous for A. If you have two identical forms of D, you're homozygous for D. We're going to pretend that this person is also heterozygous for B and C. How many different kinds of gametes can this person produce? I'm going to do a brute force enumeration. So one possibility is that we have a gamete that contains just a straight up copy of one chromosome or the other. So there are just two potential outcomes. But then we can play with permutations because there's this process called recombination in the production of gametes that rearranges the alleles. The number of variants we can get from three genes with two different alleles is eight or two to the third power. Now, since we said D is homozygous in this individual, D doesn't count. All gametes inherit the same allele of D, so they are not contributing to the variation. We can generalize this calculation. The number of different kinds of potential gametes an individual can produce is 2 to the nth power, where n is the number of heterozygous genes. All we need to do then to calculate the number of different kinds of gametes is to know how many genes you've got and how many of them are heterozygous. We know that first number to a good approximation. It's about 20,000 genes total. Although the number wobbles a bit as the identity of each of those transcribed genes is the subject of active research. How many are heterozygous in a typical individual? This is where it gets tricky. Define gene. This is a whole other big issue I don't want to get into just yet. Are we going to use each base on the chromosome as a locus? Because if we do, N gets large fast. If you look at something like microsatellite DNA, which is repetitive sequences that we get classified as mostly junk, there is a tremendous amount of variation. So if we count those, N would get huge. I'm going to punt on this question and refer you to an ancient paper, Lewinton's 1967 work on the amount of heterozygosity in the expressed proteins in flies and people, where he estimated that number was around 15% or less of the genes. It's not a perfect number, but it's a starting point, and really I'm, I'm mainly going for a qualitative estimate. 15% of 20,000 genes suggests that you are heterozygous for about 3,000 genes, so the number of different combinations of gametes you can produce is 2 to the 3,000th power, which is a great big number. I'm not even going to try and read it out loud to you. So let's just round it off. That would be a 1 with 1,204 zeros after it. That means that every sperm and egg is probably unique. You aren't going to produce the same variant by chance, it's why you and your brothers and sisters, if you have any, are completely different, even though you were made by the same pair of parents. This is without even considering that each parent is producing a similar amount of variation and recombining different arrangements at fertilization, or without considering the contribution of random mutations. But wait, I have to make two reservations. Uh, one is that this immense number is a total number of potential variants, but if we look at a single gene at a time, it's simpler. There are only two possible outcomes, a 50% chance that you get one allele, 50% that you get the other. So overall, you can think of this as the number of times you flip a coin. You're going to get half that number of heads and half that number of tails fairly closely and fairly predictably. It's just the number of combinations of all of the genes at once in a single individual is very large. Another caveat is that this is the potential number of variants. It's like this is the potential search space if you're looking to generate a specific combination. We might also ask what is the actual number of different variants an individual can produce? And that is tiny proportionally. Let's just look at ovaries first. 
ovaries develop in the fetus. And one interesting attribute is that they set aside a lifetime's worth of oocytes before the individual is born. All the egg cells a person will produce are made in utero and sequestered in the ovary in a state of arrested development and then dilled out one at a time each month, beginning at puberty. How many total eggs does the ovary contain? About a million. So out of, that, out of that vast array of potential combination, is an ovary is only going to draw about 10 to the 6th power out of 10 to the 1,204th possibilities. It's a tiny, insignificant fraction of the possible results, all determined by chance. The specific combination of genetic characteristics are largely the luck of the draw. But wait, it's worse, because ovaries are constantly pruning away oocytes. By the time it reaches puberty, it only contains about a quarter million, and at every ovulation a small collection of oocytes begin to mature, and all but one usually are discarded in a process called atresia. The total number of eggs produced by an ovary over its entire lifetime is only a few hundred and it, only a handful at best will be successfully fertilized and produce a person. Who will be born really is a chance process. It is completely indeterminate. You are the product of sampling error, a tiny slice of the immense possibilities. And remember, variation is the raw material of evolution, you variant you. Now, I know the testicles in my audience are crying out that they aren't hampered by the limitations of ovaries. Look, every single ejaculation can produce about 200 million sperm, and they can do that every day. That means that over a 60-year span of sexual activity, testes can produce over 10 to the 12th combinations. Yeah, I'm sorry, that still only explores a tiny fraction of the range of combinatorial possibilities. It also sounds exhausting. Sperm variants are also a product of chance, and all that excess doesn't really matter when we consider that the actual outcome of all that frantic activity is still only a small handful of progeny. Now, so far I've been emphasizing chance, that every generation is a random array of genes shaped by probability, and these variations are part of the evolutionary process. So this too is human evolution. It's unstoppable. It's not going to end, at least not until we go extinct. But I know there are always people who want to insist that it isn't really evolution unless selection is involved. They're wrong. But okay, let's consider that perspective in gametes. And I'm going to have to argue that most selection in humans is going on at the level of the gametes. A gamete has to be a functional cell. It has to be able to carry out basic metabolism. It has to have functional genes for motility, at least in the case of sperm. It has to be able to respond selectively to chemical signals in the environment. And it has to be able to carry out a complex developmental pattern of maturation and growth. A failure in any of those processes leads to a failure of the gamete and never gets to the point of reproduction. If there are 200 million sperm in a single ejaculation, and only one at best is going to successfully fertilize an egg, that is an example of thoroughly ruthless competition. Imagine if there was one fertile woman in America, and we told the entire male population of the country that they had to show up at her house within a certain span of days, and then be specifically selected by her for mating. And if you failed, you would be killed. I think it's safe to say the selection pressure would be intense. The importance of selection at this level is compounded by an unfortunate fact. I regret to inform the testicular members of my audience. Your sperm are generally pretty crappy compared to the sperm of other species. Even if your testes have successfully spawned offspring, they have probably done a sloppy job of it. You can be a fertile testicle, yet as much as 96% of the sperm you make may be morphologically abnormal. 68% are unable to swim, and 42% may be dead on delivery. Reproductive biologists even have fancy names for your defective sperm. 
Teratozoospermia is a condition of having grossly abnormal sperm. Asthenozoospermia is having immodal sperm. And my favorite term of all, necrozoospermia, is what you've got if you're de ejaculating dead sperm. You're lucky it only takes one to fertilize an egg, because really, compare these two semen samples from a horse and a man. Pathetic human. You should be embarrassed by the quality of your semen. Okay, I think I've made my case. Sperm and egg are part of the human condition, and they are both the products of chance and selection. Therefore, you can't possibly argue that humans are not currently evolving by any de definition you want to use. Uh, there's simply no argument on the matter. I've also made the point that human and person are significantly different, and there is an interesting, difficult discussion to be had about what ought to constitute personhood. But I've talked long enough, you'll have to do it in the comments. Or maybe I'll make another video sometime about it. Okay, bye. Thanks for listening. Talk to you later.